Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning, and um, I'm just glad to be here. Are you glad to be here this morning? Good, good. Well, it's, uh, it's a delight uh, to be with you. Every time I get on stage, I just think, man, it's a privilege to be able to share God's Word with His people. Uh, I don't take it for granted. I really enjoy it. One of the things I do, I love, I love to get up here and just be like, man, I was created to do this. I love sharing His Word, and, and I have a word that I want to share with you this morning. Pastor Terry is away uh, this weekend. He was doing performing a wedding, and so therefore... Uh, he'll be back, though. He's coming back. Uh, <laughs> that's good. And, um, but uh, in, in doing so, I wanted to talk about a few things before we get into the message. Number one, uh, men, you need to sign up for the men's deal that we have coming up. Um, you know, uh, absolutely, uh, God loves when men get together. Sometimes we sing off key, and there's other things that go on when men get together. But one of the things that happen that's really good is a fellowship that, that men have in Jesus and ca- cause us to, be, to come closer together. And so I'm, I'm just encouraged, sign up online. You can sign up in the foyer, but really sign up, be a part of a, a, and engage in, the, in our men's gathering. Also, groups have started up. Uh, amen? Yep. Yep. You know, I'm, I'm going to do that again. <laughs> hey, groups have started up. Okay, good. So if you're not if you're not part of a group and you just been like, well, I don't necessarily know. We got a we have a booklet out there. They they passed out a few weeks ago, but we do have it where you can sign up for a group. Uh, it's important for you to be connected. Amen. It's 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 important. It's not just uh, something you just come to church and just uh, attend and then go home and watch football. Um, <clears throat> of course, that's important too. But the truth is, is that we need to <laughs> we need you to engage. So so men, the men's deal we have the groups you need to sign up for that and uh, it's those those things are important and. Um, and before we, uh, again, we get in, into this message, I, I just wanted to talk to you um, about the importance of what Terry's been talking about, Pastor Terry's been talking about uh, taking responsibility. He, last time he was talking about work, talking about work and how important that was, but it's been basically the series talking about um, taking responsibility for your life. And so I'm going to continue in that same vein uh, this morning talking about that. And uh, I'm going to talk about it in twofold. Because I'm going to talk about, what I want to talk about is discipleship. Everybody say discipleship. Discipleship. Don't you say it like you mean it. There you go. (laughs) Discipleship. The reason why that's important is because uh, discipling, uh, discipleship, that's what God, uh, he called us to do that. In Matthew 28, he says, go and make disciples. Our church is about making disciples. We, it's about, when you read our booklets or you come in our, our, when you have our bulletins and different things and it says, soldier in church, uh, disciples who make a difference, right? Right? Do you guys even read those? Amen. <laughs> Disciples that, making, that make a difference. Actually, when the elders got together, they felt like that was a little redundant, a little redundant because if, if you're a disciple, you are making a difference. Right? That's what disciples do. They make a difference. But the truth is, is that you can't make a disciple. Like, what do you mean? You said making disciples and make a difference. Here's what I mean by that. You can't make anybody, you can't make somebody do something. Right? You can lead a horse to water, but... You can't make him drink if he's not thirsty, right? And so it's about making disciples. It has to do with with you as a person, as an individual. So that's what I'm going to talk about twofold this morning. I want to talk about discipleship individually. Then I want to talk about discipleship uh, as it relates to the family. Those are two things, two aspects that I want to talk about this morning because those two things are important. Uh, And so we're going to get started. I'm going to pray. So pray with me. Lord, we thank you this morning that we have this opportunity to be here this morning and a part of what you're doing, God. We know that it's you, that it's in you that we move and breathe and have our being. At the same time, Lord, we're asking you to show us great and mighty things that we don't know about. We're asking you to open up. We want our hearts to be open, our minds to be open to, to really hear what the Spirit of God is saying. Help us to hear what the Spirit of God is saying so that we can do what you've called us to do, be who you've called us to be. And we thank you, Lord, that you are, that you are helping us, Lord, to see you in a new light. And so we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you enjoyed Dennis last week? It was good? Good stuff? If you, if you did not, um, if you weren't here, I'm going to encourage you to, to get the, the, go online and, and look at it uh, and watch it. It was really good stuff. Dennis has a unique perspective about what's going on in the world and for us to get a new perspective. How many of you know God wants to, us to get his perspective on what's going on in the world? 
not the world's perspective, not whatever, your emotions uh, perspective, but God's perspective about what's going on. And so uh, here's what I'm going to start with by saying this. Uh, I love this church. I really love this church. I love this body. I love this leadership. I love you. I love every, all the things that are about this church. And I'm just going to tell you why. Uh, this past week, uh, Vanessa and I were talking about just our life, you know, turning 40 this year because I'm getting old and I'm just kidding. Not really. Um, but uh, turning 40 this year, I'm looking back at my life and I'm, I, got a, I got a daughter. My oldest daughter, Ainsley, is about to graduate from high school. Um, you know, my, I got two uh, humongous boys who look like jolly green giants, you know, and I got, you know, and I'm thinking about my, my life and all the things that have gone back. And Vanessa and I were saying, she's like, you know, we've been able to date, get married, have kids, have a career, uh, all here at this church. When we first started coming here, I was 19 years old, 19, I was a teenager, and, I, and we were dating, Vanessa and I were dating. Uh, and I remember we, we, we didn't necessarily come, we were at the old building, we started at the old building, and then we came here, and um, one of the things that as we were dating, I was thinking to myself, was like, we were like, what are we going to do? So we, I was like, I'm just going to go to church here. I thought, this is seriously, I thought I would just come here just to appease Vanessa for a little bit, and then go to a black church, or go somewhere else, you know what I'm saying? That was my goal. I'd be like, well, I'll just go to this church, okay, we'll go to this church. <laughs> 21 years later, you know. <laughs> I'm still here at this church, you know, still here, sojourn. And, and, and it's great. It's really been great because, but here's one of the things that happened. Um, I got hooked, you know, because uh, I got hooked on pa Pastor Terry's message on love. I got hooked on the worship. Um, uh, we don't have it near as good. We, don't, we, we didn't have it near as good as we got it now. We got the best worship leader in the world. How many of you guys know that? Absolutely, the best worship leader in the world. And so uh, you get hooked on that stuff. You go to other churches, you'll be like, oh, Lord. And then you come to soldier, you'll be like, ah, you know what I'm saying? That's bad when you have to go to church and it's just, it's not even words. You have to just, for just sound, it sounds, you know, uh, uh, you know, all that stuff in the spirit. And so that's where we, we got hooked here. We were, we were, and so, but one of the, the, the decisions that we made as a couple, as we were dating, we had somebody uh, come in, help us with our, with our dating. We just said, look, we are not going to just attend church and just be one of those people that come to church, check it off your list, and then go home, and, you know, and just, and just, you know, forget about it the rest of the week. We really wanted to engage because the guy who was doing marriage counseling with us said to us, he goes, if you're going to have, if you guys are going to get married, you need to settle down, get in a church, settle down, be be there. He said, if it's not this church, that'd be somewhere else. We need to be there and get in a place where you can grow and be a part of that church and be a part of what's going on in that church. And I said, okay. I said, we'll do that. So we decided, and he asked us to write all these things down. Write out your goals. Write out the things that you want to do. I was like, man, I don't make a lot of money. You know what I'm saying? I'd be, I'd be good looking, all that stuff. <laughs> Scratch that out. You know what I'm saying? I want to do this. And so all this stuff. And he said, and then write down your expectations for your wife. I'm like, I want meals all the time. You know what I'm saying? I want to make sure that, you know, I, I get everything I want whenever I want it, how I want it. You know what I'm saying? I wrote that stuff down. And then I wrote, put an asterisk by it a couple times, you know. And so he said, all right, give them to me. I gave, he gave it to him. I was like, yeah, you're going to give it to my wife? You know, he balled it up and threw it in the trash. <laughs> That's a true story. It happened at this church, in that office. <laughs> it hurt my feelings. No, I'm just kidding. So here's what happened. And so he's like, he goes, what do you do that for? He's like, well, you're writing your expectations of what your expectations are going to be in your wife. He goes, you have no expectations. Your expectations need to be on Jesus. He said, I don't care what your expectations are. I don't care what you think they should be. I don't care what you think she should do, whatever. Your expectation should be on God and then what he wants to do in your life. And so when you're going to do that, you need to make sure that you, you walk and be a disciple. And, and make, be a disciple and make a difference. That's what we have. Our, it's making disciples who make a difference. Disciples of passion, purity, power, and prayer. That's our desire for you. We don't, we don't want to just have a church service just to have it, but our desire is for you to be a disciple. Why? Because we know if you're a disciple and you walk in and walk in, in the discipleship that God has for you, you're going to grow. You're going to learn. You're going to be able to do what God's called you to do and be. Amen? It's, it's, it's important for you to be a disciple. 
disciple. It's not just, it's not just coming to church. If you think that just coming in here, sitting, uh, standing in here, listening to some good songs, engaging in worship, hearing the announcements, hearing a good message, and then leaving, and then coming back and doing the same thing over again, and coming back and doing the same thing over again, if you think that's the goal of what Christianity is about, you are missing the mark. And I'm just going to be honest with you. You're missing the mark. The goal is for discipleship. The goal is for you to grow. The goal is for you to, 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 to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know that the labor that you're working is not in vain. That's the goal. Discipleship. Everybody say it again. Discipleship. In case you are missing what this message is about. It's about us walking and being a disciple. And one of the ways that that, that happens is, and, we, and so, because I thought I had it. I thought I knew what that was. I thought, man, listen, I got this. This in the bag. I'm going to be the best, best husband. I, I would tell Vanessa, girl, I'd be like, girl, I'm going to love you so good. You know, and my Barry White voice, girl, I'm going to love you like you ain't never been loved before. <laughs> and that music come on. And, and I'm, I'm going to be the best father I can be. I'm going to be, I mean, I'm going to be amazing. Come to find out, I didn't know nothing about being a husband. I didn't know anything about being a dad. I didn't know anything about being, the, being a good, even a good employee. I didn't know anything about that. You know, I mean, I had it modeled with my parents, but I mean, I had baggage. I'm dragging my luggage into the marriage. She's dragging hers into the, into the marriage. And so we just like one big bend of luggage. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I had a way that I think it should be done. She has a way that she thinks it should be done. So how many know when those two things come together, there is chaos, amen? And so I had to learn what it's like to be a husband. It's like, well, she's supposed to do what I want her to do. Ha-ha! <laughs> that is not the case. <laughs> well, he's supposed, he's supposed to do what I want him to do. Ha-ha-ha! <laughs> that is not the case. What does it work? It's supposed to be two people dying to themselves so that their marriage can be what God's called it to be. I'm supposed to love my wife as Christ loved the church. She's supposed to respect me. You know, and so it's one of those different things. So I would focus on what she's supposed to do, and she would focus on what I'm supposed to do, and it doesn't work like that, right? See, some of y'all are just like, hey, don't, stop hitting your husbands and wives. Y'all stop doing that. Stop elbowing them. Okay, so here's the truth. The truth is, is that I needed help. And so I, I, I asked people to help me because I, I, I don't want you guys to think, man, pastors, you guys don't have issues, man. I'm telling you what, I had to learn the hard way that the word fine has different meanings in a marriage, <laughs> right? When she goes, how do I look? I go, fine. You can't do that. That's out of bounds. You can't say that. You got to be like, girl, you look so good right now. Oh, my, turn around. Turn around. Let me see how, you know what I'm saying? You got to gash your shorty up. Every time she come out and she, you got to say, girl, you, don't, you look fine. You know what I'm saying? That's the way you say it. And so, and so when she tells you, go ahead and do whatever you want to do. Don't do whatever you want to do. <laughs> you know it's true, right? I've even, I've even got clarity one time and say, so you're saying that I can do whatever I want to do. Yeah, go ahead. I'm going to do it, you know, then come back and be in trouble. You know what I'm saying? So it's different things. You got to learn. I had to learn the hard way, right? When she cooked food or whatever, you got to be like, man, it's so good. I'm just telling you, just had to learn the hard way. So the truth is, I, I just needed help. I did not know how to do these things for myself. And so you know what plays into it? A key for discipleship is humility. You have to walk in humility. It's an attitude of the heart. To say, you know what, I don't know everything that I, there is to know about being a disciple or being who God's called me to be. I don't know every, what all there is to, about these things, so I need some help in that. I need somebody to help me to understand what it is to be that. And it's an attitude that you have to take on in order to do that, to, to, to learn and understand that. I mean, I just, I, I don't understand what, what it is. And then and the humility comes with saying, that I'm, I'm going to get under somebody and they're going to show me. I'm not going to just attend, but I'm going to engage here at this church, and I'm going to go, I'm not going to join a group just because they're begging me to, but I understand that as I do this, I'm engaging with the body that Christ has uh, designed for me to be a part of, and that I'm not, uh, it's not the individual of Christ, but it is a body of Christ, and therefore when I be a part of his body, that I'm engaging and I'm getting everything that the body needs to be able to function the way it needs to function. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? I know you're looking at me a little funny. Because let me just tell you something. The reason why, cause, uh, the reason why that this is the, important is because there's a ton of things that are going on right now and the church needs to arise and shine and let the light come forth. Amen? That's, that's important. Turn your Bibles with me to, to Acts chapter 
Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read something to you. And this is, this is, this is important. Here's, here's what you need to know as you're turning there. You, you cannot make a disciple of someone who doesn't want to be a disciple. Right? You, you can try to, try to tell them, teach them, whatever. They, if they want to be a disciple, you're not going to be a disciple. A disciple is also somebody who takes responsibility for their life. Amen? Somebody who takes responsibility for themselves to follow after, after Jesus. So here's what Acts chapter 2, verse 40, it says. It's, it starts with, yeah, verse 40. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. Anybody know that that's kind of going on right now? Anybody sense that? Crooked generation stuff going on right now. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now get this. Here's what it says, the next verse. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and of the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all and came, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who, were, all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing their proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, here's what I want you to get out of this, out of this verse. In the beginning part of verse, uh, verse 42 said, And they, it didn't talk about just the apostles doing this, but the believers, the ones who were attending the, the church, the people that were added to, they, they did this. They were devoted themselves. They were devoted to do, to, to, uh, uh, to attend themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. How many of you need fellowship? Need fellowship. You need to attend to the teaching and the breaking of bread and with prayer. It was in, in common upon the believers, the ones who were, uh, were going to the church, the ones who were at, going to the group, going to the fellowship, the breaking of bread together. It was incumbent upon them to become a disciple. Nobody was trying to make them do it. The apostles didn't make them do it. They said, and they did this. This is what they were wanting to do. Why? Because they were hungry for the things of God. You guys remember when you first got saved, how hungry you were? Anybody remember? Anybody other than me were hungry for the things of God? You know what I'm talking about? My wife right now is at a, at a women's retreat cooking for about 40 women. Because that's what she does. She's a chef. She cooks for, she cooks for different, big, large groups. And ma actually, before I married her, her maiden name was Cook. It's really, that's a true story. She, and she can cook, man. Oh, wow, can she cook? She's a good cook. And so uh, when I first got married, you know, I, she, would want, she wanted to cook for me all the time. And so she would, you know, I had this expectation that she would cook like, you know, fried chicken, you know, because, you know, black people love that stuff, um, and corn, you know, all the soul food and stuff like that. But she didn't. She cooked white food, spaghetti, you know, mashed potatoes, you know. That kind of stuff. Shepherd's pie. I didn't know what shepherd's pie was. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, what is shepherd's pie? What is that? You know what I'm saying? She's like, this is good for you. I'm like, I don't understand. How are you going to put corn and meat and mashed potatoes? I don't know, man. You put some Crisco in it and cook it. You know what I'm saying? Put some Crisco on everything, right? <laughs> just fry it, you know? Nike, just do it. Black people, just fry it. That's what we do. You know what I'm saying? But she didn't. She, she would cook. But here's the deal. I would, she would have these meals cooked for me when I got home. I worked at Delta Airlines. I was hungry. Eight hours a day working in that hot sun, you know, uh, on the ramp. I was working for them, and I'd come home. And listen, when I, and, and it's, the whole event started when I, when I drove up in the driveway. I could smell the food on the outside. And I would smell it. That aroma would grab me by the nose, and I would, it would carry me into the kitchen, grab me by the throat, put me in the headlock, and say, come on in this kitchen, boy. And so I get on in the kitchen, and all of a sudden, it, would, it wouldn't stop there. It would pull me into the stove, and I'd take the top off the pot, and oh, man, it smells so good. I was so hungry, and I would just sit there, and I'd just be like, bring it on. And I would sit there on the table, and I'd eat that. So I was like, oh, it's so good. And so she'd be like, I made that for you. It's like, oh, it's so good, honey. It's so great. But there would be some times also that I'd be driving home from work, and I would have my windows rolled down, and another smell would hit me. Whataburger would come in through my window. <laughs> Whataburger would come in through my window and grab me, and you know what that smell did? 
it would turn my signal on all by itself and turn right on into the restaurant take my order. I don't even know how it did it, the number three, with extra fries and extra ketchup and hold the mayo but put extra mustard on it. I don't know how it knew, but the smell would do that. Pull me right in there and order that food for me and I would eat it on the way home. And all of a sudden I'd get home, I'd get home and Vanessa would have that same smell and I'd walk in and she'd be like, honey, I made that for you. I'd be like, I'm not that hungry. And she would say things like, have you eaten of the tree that I've told you not to eat of? (laughs) Right? I'd be like, it was that debit card you gave me. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what it was, what it was about. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't be as hungry, right? Because she'd cook this meal for me. Now, that's funny. It is funny. But let me just tell you something. We do that all the time when it comes to what God has for us. We're, God, here's God, and Vanessa would make this food with love. She'd put her hands in it. She'd put her, her everything into this, into this meal. And she would, do, she would put her love and her thoughts, and she would think about a meal that I would like, and then all of a sudden, I would stop off and do something else. Listen, here's what God's saying. I have designed for you a place that you can be able to get everything that you need to be the disciple that I've called you to be and do. But when we stop off and, and get things of this world that do not satisfy, then it causes us not to be hungry for the things that God has for us. God is saying, listen, if you wouldn't stop off at those places and you would be hungry for the things that I have for you, I have a place that I've designed for you to go. I've done things for you that no one else has done for you and I'm calling you to a deeper place. Stop feasting on the things of this world that do not satisfy, but feast on what I have for you because what I have for you will satisfy the very inside of you. Everything that you need to be everything that I've called you to be and therefore call your and be a disciple and walk therein so that you can do and partake of what he has. Amen? You understand what I'm telling you? So it's, so it's the utmost. So we stop off and we're worried about what the world thinks and we're, we're trying to feast on this and we're trying to feast on that. And God's like, I have for you right now. I've designed, put my love, I put my heart. You know what? I've put everything into, I've given my son to die for you so that you can have what you need to be a, a disciple. So it's time to stop feasting of the things of this world and start feasting on what God has for you. What is that? It's discipleship. Walk and be a disciple. It's his son feasting on Jesus because he has everything for us. And so I, 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 would, you know, and I would try to justify and be like, well, you know, I was hungry. I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait. She goes, yes, you could. And then she started finding those receipts in my pocket. You know what I'm saying? She'd be like, where you been? Yeah, absolutely busted. Where you been? Nowhere. Mm-hmm. Don't you know I'm a spiritual being? The Holy Spirit going to tell me when you stop off. And you're like, I know, man, goodness gracious. Here's the truth. God wants us to walk in everything. I mean, he's such an awesome and amazing father. that he has given us everything that we need to be who he's called us to be. Amen? So humility says, you know what, God? I'm going to submit my life. I'm going to submit myself to you. I'm going to take it upon myself not to just come to church and just go through the motions, not just to sing some songs, but I know you have something for me. I know you have something for me. That not, not just I'm talking about coming to church. I'm talking about it. That's why we have groups. That's why we have, we're having baptisms today. I'm going to dunk some people. Uh, that's why we have some, uh, I'm just kidding. We, we really do have baptisms today. We're going to have a great time. But I'm telling you, we have, that's why we have free indeed, so you can be free. You know, that's why we have all these different things, so that you can partake of everything that God has for you. Amen? And so it's, it's just, it's time of, so humility is that. Humility is, is what causes us to step in and say, you know what, God, I, I don't know what it is. That I don't know what you have for me, but I'm saying yes to it. Amen? A disciple takes responsibility for their life. That's what we do. You're supposed to, you're supposed to take responsibility for your life. You can't blame somebody else for your life. When you stand before the judgment seat, you can't, you can't, you can't, I can't stand there for you. I can't be, I'm not going to be an advocate for you. I have to stand for myself and my family, but you take responsibility for your life. That was the best decision that Vanessa and I made was to try to, was coming here at this church because we didn't know. I would try to find people in the church that, that, I, that I, I was like, I want my marriage to, to be after. Terry and Susan, man, I love, they just love each other. And they just, man, I'm telling you, I go places with them, they hold hands. When I didn't know how to do that, I see them hold hands, I'd be like, Try to grab Vanessa's hand. She's like, you know, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> I would see them doing that. Or the same thing with people with kids. I see some, some kids, some people's kids, and I'd be like, man, I want my kids to be like that. And so I start talking with them and different things because I didn't know. I thought I knew what, how to be a good dad. 
I mean, we had Angel. Angel was such a good baby. We would set her down in the floor, and we would go to the movies and come back. As a, I'm, I'm just kidding. Look at y'all. Put your phone down. Stop calling CPS. That was a joke. But seriously, she would stay right where she would stay right where she was. We were like, "Oh, man, we got it made. We got a good baby. We know how to do it." And then CJ came along. And I swear up and down, there was something, down, something wrong with him. I went to the doctor one day because he screamed day and night, day and night, day and night. I'm talking about all of a sudden I was doing this like the King James Version, and they do not stop day and night. And I'm like, and he would sit there and just cry. I went to the doctor one day and I had his carriage. I dropped it on the floor. And I said, do something with this kid. And they were like, well, he has colic. I go, what is that? I go, it's gas. I go, I have gas all the time, and I don't do that. I don't be screaming. I don't scream. <laughs> Absolutely something wrong with this dude. We knew that we didn't know what it was. We didn't have a clue on how to raise kids, you know? I mean, when we were, when, 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 when Braden and different ones and Angel was born, but that's what make their food. She'd put it in the tray and make it delicately. And then I'd be on the couch with the kids. be like, they'd be like, Daddy, I'm hungry. I'm like, there's some popcorn on my shirt. Why don't you go ahead and grab some of that? By the time they get older, we just, we were just like, man, just got tired of whatever. We didn't know what it was to try to raise them. We tried to do what our parents did. We didn't know. So we would start taking groups. So, you know, that, that group, what was it? Beating your kids God's way. Whatever it was, that group that we had. Uh, oh, growing kids God's way. That's what it was. Sorry. <laughs> We would take these different groups and different things because we did not know. But I'm telling you, all these things, you're laughing, but it's an attitude that says, I don't know. God, help me because I want to I, I be the best disciple. I want to be the best follower of Christ that I can be. So therefore, I need, to, I need to humble myself under the mighty hand of God because he says that if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he would exalt you in due season, right? So it's an attitude of the heart. Disciple, I, I, this is something that I want to do. Let me show you something. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 4. This is, this is, this is what, it, what it was right here. It's one of these things. Where it says, Genesis chapter 4, verse, verse 1. Here's what it says. Because now I'm talking about family. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel, now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering and fruit of the ground. Now here's why I'm stopping right there. Because when I'm looking in the word of God for what it means to disciple my family, and I go back to the original mandate, and I'm looking for it, and it says, in the process, in the course of time, they skipped over all the stuff in between. I'm looking at the stuff. I'm trying to find the stuff. Yeah, yeah. she bore the, the kids, but then what school did they go to? Was Adam righty or lefty? What diapers did they use? What do you do when they poop and it, and it shoots out the side and ruins your clothes? What about spit up? What do you do when they go in the closet and they try to drink the Drano under the sink? You know, what do you do when, when, they, when they're fighting all the time? How do you train them? That's what they, they just, in the, those little words, in the course of time. I'm like, I need more than in the course of time. I need help because I don't necessarily know how, how to raise them. I don't know how to do this. Here's what the Bible says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, even so that he gave himself up for, for it. Then, wives, submit yourselves honor and honor uh, respect your husbands. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's good. But what about this? What about that? What school should they go to? What kind of friends should they hang around? What videos do they need to watch? Is it Xbox? Do they need to have a PlayStation? What, what is it? What is, what, what is it? And you know what? The truth of the matter is, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Husbands, love, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and even so that he gave himself. He comes back to that. When I talk to Pastor Terry, when I'm coming to him, and I'm asking him certain questions, he is steadfast, and he always gives me the same answer. When I'm like, I need more than that, he's like, this is, I'll say things like, what is the key? Pastor Terry, to life, to success. Why do I, you know, and if I want to get real good, I'll go, I'll, go, I'll go King James on him. What must I do to be <laughs> saved? What do I need to do? And he's just like, spend time with God, spend time with your wife, spend time with your kids. I know that. But what do I need to do? 
to gain and train them. I want to bring my wife into a place of, uh, that she knows that I love her. And she, spend time with God, spend time with your wife, spend time with your kids. I know that, but still, how can I? He never changes his answer. Do you know why? Because we're looking at his life. He spent time with God, spent time with his wife, and spent time with his kids. Amen? So we try to make it all comfortable, all complicated. And the truth is, is God's not interested in, in you being comfortable, but he's interested in you being conformed into the image of his son. If you're going to be conformed to the image of his son, you can submit yourself, submit yourself to leaders. Let me ask you this question. Who in here right now, and you don't have to answer this question, you don't have to answer it right now, but I want you to think about it. Who is discipling you? Who is speaking into your life on a regular basis? Who are you submitted to? Who is pouring into you? I'm not talking about just coming. I come to church and I hear a message. I'm not talking about that. Who do you have personal relationship with and that person is pouring and spending time with you and you can answer and tell me who it is? I don't even have to tell me right now, but there's something I want you to think about. And I'm not talking about some weird deal where you just be like, I'll submit myself unto you because I think we did away with slavery a long time ago. But I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about submitting yourself and having someone pour into you. I want you to think about that because that's important. Amen? It's important. Is anybody else like me that's looking at society and trying to figure out and can get overwhelmed? I'm not even talking about looking at the news. I'm not talking about reading a magazine. I'm not talking about um, all the media stuff. But looking at the world right now and thinking, oh, my gosh, I can get overwhelmed trying to find out how we're going to change the world. Anybody else besides me can get overwhelmed by that. I, and I was asking the Lord, this is when I was talking to Pastor Terry about this, is this the way we're going to do it? One disciple at a time, one family at a time. The family, the original small group. I don't have to answer for your family, but I do have to answer for mine, right? I have to answer for how I raise my kids. I have to answer by, for, for the way that I love my wife. I have to answer for that. And here's, here's a, a public service announcement that I want to make to you that you need to understand. It is not about you. Amen. It's not about you. Stop trying to make it just about you. It is. We, it, we're, it's just like, well, I'm consuming my thoughts about what me, me, me. No, God, what do you want me to do? Because you know what's best. And you have good things in store for me. Amen? Parents, let me just tell you this. Here's another announcement. It is not children's church job to raise your kids. I'm going to say it again. It is not children's ministry's job to raise your kids. It is your responsibility to raise your kids. You know, when we were kids and growing up, my, and the parents, my parents would go to, a, uh, and it, when I was going to public school, they'd go in and they would, the teacher would, I would have a problem and they would say, my parents would be like, mm-hmm, I know it was, it was Chris's fault. I know he was a problem. I'll take care of it when we get home. Now it's swapped. The parents are blaming the teachers. The parents are blaming other people instead of pointing the problem back at them. You hear what I'm saying? I know it's truth. I know it's hurting, but it's okay. I'm going to say it anyway. It's the truth is you have to take responsibility for your own kids. Here's another announcement. Our youth ministry, not designed to raise your kids. It is your responsibility to raise your kids. We will aid you and assist you and pray for you, pray for them, and try to do the best job that we can, but it is your responsibility to raise your kids. Can I get amen? amen. Can I get a louder one than that? I want to make sure you understand that. And here's the truth of the matter is that God has called you to do that. And therefore, it's incumbent upon you to do what God's called you. Be a disciple and disciple your family. Disciple your own kids. When Vanessa wakes up in the morning, 7 o'clock on the dot, she spends time with the kids and in the Word. And then I spend time with the kids in the Word. I pray over them. Ainsley, where we're going to school because she's learning how to drive, I pray extra hard. <laughs> but we pray. As a family, that's what we did because my parents did that. My parents taught us how to do that. In closing, I'm going to tell you the story. When I was about 15, 16 years old, I told you guys that my mom, was. she's a principal now, but she's a teacher. She taught geometry, French, Algebra 1, Algebra 2, and um, she, she taught um, English. <laughs> and it's horrible because I don't speak it very well. But anyway... Um, but she taught, she taught those classes, and my dad was on the school board at the Christian school that I was going to. And um, it, was during, it was during a time where I was, I was not doing what I was supposed to, to do, and um, I, was, um, I remember my mom had a geometry test, and I was cheating on this test. 
I know y'all are gasping me like, Pastor Chris, absolutely. I was cheating on that test. I'd rather cheat than make a bad grade and get beat down. Anyway, so I was, uh, I was, I was cheating on this test. And I had this ba- my basketball coach and my youth pastor and our campus pastor happened to walk in while I was cheating on this test. And uh, with a smile on his face, he said, are you cheating on this test? I go, yes, I am. I'm cheating on this test. And you caught me. And he goes, um, he made me go in there and tell, tell my parents, tell my mom what I did. And so here recently I caught up with him, my basketball coach slash youth pastor slash campus pastor, and we had lunch. And I was talking with him, and I was like, I forgive you. <laughs> what you did to me so many years ago. He goes, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you had a test. You caught me cheating on. He goes, I was praying every day that I'd catch somebody cheating on the test, and I just happened to catch you that day. He goes, but you're wrong. He goes, I did not turn you in. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, all I did was tell you what was right, and because of the teaching of your parents and your mom and dad, you went and turned yourself in because they discipled you. The Holy Spirit was working in you, and you did that yourself. Okay, I'm not mad at you anymore. And that's what I'm telling you. It's important for you to, to disciple you. Put those things on the inside of them so that they already know who their God is. I'm going to tell you something funny. That youth pastor slash campus pastor slash uh, basketball coach is here this morning. Steve Nine, would you stand up this morning? He's here this morning. My youth pastor. <laughs> <laughs> he, he'd been in Ecuador and um, doing with kids around the world and we're trying to do I'm trying to find out exactly what what that is but I remember him spending time with me as a kid I went everywhere with him he was teaching me I was like what do I need to do and and, and I didn't think that he'd ever thought I'd be in ministry he went to Christ for the nations I went to Christ for the nations uh, I didn't think I'd be in ministry but now I am here I am still in, I'm in ministry and all because somebody took some time to spend with me but I had to also take some time to say you know what I want to be teachable I want to be faithful and I want to be available. So I want to ask you, are you teachable? Are you faithful? Are you available? Are you walking in humility? Who's pouring into your life? Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Amen? Those are things that I'm asking you. Those things I want you to, I'm putting a challenge out there. This is the reason why. So I use a lot of humor in my messages and stuff, but it wasn't always that way. I was a depressed kid, 16, when he found me, I was depressed. I was so depressed, my parents were trying to take me to a place, and I was living in Arkansas, my parents were trying to take me to a place here in in Dallas because depression had so ruled my life, and I was just, I was done. Had suicidal thoughts, all those things in my life. I wanted to kill myself, I had all these these things. It was a time in my life that was so dark. My parents didn't know what to do with me, and I heard them crying and asking, God, I don't know what to do with Chris. He's so depressed, he so doesn't have a life, we don't know what to do with him. And all of a sudden, someone came in my life, and helped me, spoke destiny into my life, and asked, do you want to stay in this place, or do you want to go on from here? And here I am, right here in front of you guys, sharing the gospel. Ron, can I have that microphone? Real quick, I want you to stand as I end. I, I actually want Steve to pray a blessing over you guys. Hey, thank you. Steve, come up here real quick. Give him a hand as he comes. He's, a, he's been a great guy. He was a good coach. I would foul out every quarter, the first quarter of every game. I was foul. I had a big booty. I still do. And I would just foul out. But I wanted him to, I want his discipleship. I just want him to pray over you guys. I asked him to do it in Spanish and in English. But just lift your hands if you would, just receive. Amen. Father, we just thank you this morning and we just come before you. Padre, damos gracias en este mañana y venimos delante de ti. Y nos queremos presentar delante de ti como tus hijos. We present ourselves before you this morning as your children. For you sent your son here to be the master that we would follow and be his disciples. Porque tú has enviado su hijo para ser nuestro maestro, para que nosotros pudimos ser discípulos. Y no solamente ser sus discípulos, sino también discipular a los demás. You didn't call us to be his disciples, but you've also called us and you've sent us that we would go and that we would disciple others. So in this room this morning, Lord, we humble ourselves and we 
present ourselves before you and we say, Lord, cause us to grow, change us and transform us, continue to keep us on the potter's wheel. Nosotros nos presentamos delante de ti en esta mañana, decimos que, que venga y obra en nuestras vidas y no dejas de formarnos a su imagen y transformarnos desde adentro. And Lord, we also ask that you would show us those that are around us who you've called us to disciple. For sheep do not choose their shepherds, but Lord, you've called us to go. Even as you went and you called your disciples, you've sent us to those and you've shown us to them. You've called us to go to them. Lord, we want to be faithful to respond to that call. We want to get up out of our comfort zones, and we want to go out to those who are needy and those who are hurting. We want to show your love to them and be your disciples. Padre, pedimos que tú nos convences de quiénes son las personas a nuestro alrededor, a lo cual que tú quieres que estamos discipulando, que podemos ser tus siervos hacia ellos. So, Father, I bless this place and... And, and the minister here and each and every believer who's here, who's hearing your word today, that we would be convicted by your word, challenged by your word, encouraged by your word, empowered by your word today, that we are your disciples and that you're doing your work in us and through us. And Father, we thank you for it. We want to come with humbleness of heart. Say, here we are, Lord, send us, use us to change the world one person at a time, one family at a time, by your goodness and by your grace. Entonces, Padre, nos presentamos delante de ti para que nos uses como instrumentos de cambio en nuestro mundo y que tú puedes obrar en nosotros. En el nombre de Cristo Jesús lo pedimos. Amén. 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 Thank you. Well, hey, listen, I hope you enjoyed this message. Uh, I hope it wasn't too harsh. I do. Hey, I love you. I care about you. I, I just want to see us change the world. And we're going to do it one person at a time as a disciple and one family at a time. And it starts with me. It starts with you. It starts with us. Amen? Amen. You are dismissed. I love you. You guys have a great week.